Okay, the, the next area that we're going to uh, look at a little more closely is the, the term multimodality. Also, a term that goes with multimodality for us is synesthesia. When a child is born into the world, uh, they touch, they make noises, uh, they draw, they feel. You know, a, a, a child, uh, as they come to become, as they, as they grow and as they become uh, more human in their learning and their understanding, uh, uh, they use synesthetic ways in getting there. Once we put them into a, a learning environment, however, the mission of the traditional school from kindergarten through to the university is to kind of strip out as much as possible the touching, uh, the noise, the uh, uh, interrupting uh, when you're not being asked to, to speak. Um, all those things that uh, are involved in making meaning are stripped out in favour of alphabetical literacy all the way through to the top. And at the end, it's the essay, it's the quiz, it's what you can write uh, in, alpha, in some symbolic form that is highly valued as evidence, as the artefact of your knowledge. And everything else that you use to make meaning is regarded as uh, unnecessary, uh, getting in the way. Uh, but what we've tried to do with the Multiliteracies Project is to kind of claim a, a set of modes which we think as a consequence of new technology as well as a consequence of human creativity are important in the way in which all disciplines make knowledge uh, at, at all ages. And these are the ones that we've put together. Of course, oracy, we, we talk and we speak and there are different ways of speaking. And we've already said that the um, institutions uh, often require one type of speaking. Uh, and what happens at Hablak, it took uh, decades and decades before women with my kind of voice and my kind of sound were regarded as something, you, as voices or sound you could put on the radio or on television because it was irritating, I gather, uh, to some parts of uh, the audience or wasn't regarded to have the heavy weight of, of a male voice. Uh, so those sorts of things exist against each mode. But oracy is uh, one of the means in which we make meaning. Uh, and we separate oracy from writing because writing is an artefact. It's something entirely artificial that we have produced uh, in order that it's portable and we can uh, advance uh, uh, particular agendas and particular content areas. And of course, visual meaning, we have... Um, one of the members of our multi-literacies group, Gunter Kress, says the visual is what's dominating the world at the moment and it will take over uh, the way in which uh, meaning is made uh, through uh, the use of images. Uh, the example uh, I give um, about this one sometimes is that um, the prison in Abu Ghraib uh, had uh, there was a report written about it by the Red Cross about the sorts of things that were going on there, um, the kind of torture that was happening to the prisoners. And it was written in perfect alphabetical literacy. It was on the internet. Uh, the countries of the world had seen it. The leaders of the world had seen it. No one took any notice of it. Somebody went into the prison uh, with a phone, snapped a picture of a man standing on a box with a uh, hooded entirely with uh, electrical uh, cords coming out of his body. And that one picture reverberated around the world. It reverberated in, in the halls of government, in the halls of legal uh, entities, and it made meaning in a way that the perfect alphabetical literacy report of the Red Cross didn't. So visual meaning increasingly, I mean, we talk to each other in pictures now. We send Instagram Im images to each other um, in order to that tell more than any words can, uh, can tell. So the visual is becoming critical across all disciplines as well and not just in social life. And of course, the spatial space has always made meaning. Um, uh, but we have physical space now, we have virtual space. How do we understand it? How do we move around in the virtual space as well as in the physical place? How are education entities created? Uh, where does the teacher stand? Where do the students stand? What's the relationship between inside and outside when you have, you know, uh, Wi-Fi? So space uh, is a meaning domain. It's a mode for making meaning. And tactile uh, meanings are important. Also, uh, touch 
uh, objects, uh, uh, things in the world in themselves uh, have uh, an impression on our minds and, and on our uh, sensibilities. And gestural, uh, the body, the way in which our bodies, uh, in, uh, uh, w the way in which we present them to the world, the way in which we uh, deal with parts of our body, um, that's also a powerful meaning-making mode that needs to be understood. And of course, audio. And audio, again, as a consequence of the digital mode, uh, is becoming much more uh, a significant mode of circulating knowledge and information uh, than ever before in educational contexts. So these were the ones, uh, these were the, the domains that we'd originally set up with the multiliteracies group. Um, we've sort of thought about it since then and have some uh, further thinking about it. So remember, one of the aspects of multiliteracies, one of the multis, is multimodality. Um, and we've got um, a concept that we use to describe the relationship between the different modes. So we've got this kind of typology of modes, if you like, and the word we use to describe the relationships um, is synesthesia. Now, in fact, in psychology, synesthesia is used in a much narrower sense. It's somebody, well, it's actually regarded as a condition, to be quite frank. It's somebody who, um, when they hear a number, think of a colour, or, um, you know, when they taste something, they see an image. So it's actually regarded as a psychological condition, but we're using it kind of more metaphorically to talk about the way in which we swap between one form of moon meaning and another. So we've got a diagram here, which is a kind of a, a rough map of these different forms of meaning. Um, you'll see that we've separated oral and written. And I want to really emphasize that, um, that what we've done in literacy is that we have kind of relatively unreflexively expected that writing would be a transliteration of speech. So what we do is we teach kids phonics, and you know what, there are 44 sounds in the English language and they can all be represented with, uh, with letters, the alphabet and, and, and diphthongs. Um, and we teach those and we expect that what you will do is you will sound out a word um, and by sounding out the word uh, which is written alphabetically, you will be able to understand its meaning because um, you know, the written word corresponds with the spoken word. So we built a kind of a set of pedagogies where we very closely align speaking and writing. What we want to do is we want to break that apart and we want to say that in fact, speaking and writing are radically different things from each other. Just one simple example is I'm just speaking a pile of clauses one after the other um, with uh, all sorts of redundancy, all sorts of corrections, all sorts of mistakes, um, particularly the case in conversation. You know, I'm doing this now as a kind of a lecture format. And it's a little bit less rambling, a little less, it's a little bit more like writing, but it's still speech in the sense that there are no sentences. It's just clauses and phrases all put on top of each other in this kind of uh, way. So one of the things is the grammar of writing and the grammar of speaking are radically different. And what's interesting is that when we do writing, it's essentially a visual practice. So to separate off the visual from writing is a funny thing to do, which is what we try to do in literacy, when in fact, you know, um, a lot of writing is spatial, which is paragraphs are a spatial event. Um, you know, that when you get a newspaper or a printed product or you look at a text on a screen, it's a juxtaposition of image and text. And of course, when we do Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, it's all about the juxtaposition of image and text. When we do science, it's about the juxtaposition of image and text, the diagram or the photograph, which is explained in words. These things rarely work by themselves as separate modes. And in a sense, what's being juxtaposed more powerfully in, in education is not the written with the oral, but the, um, the written with the visual. So we want to say that the connection between the written and the visual is every bit as powerful as the connection between the oral and the written. So that's why we built this kind of circle. And we built the circle around things which we've kind of juxtapo juxtaposed because they kind of kind of fit together. So the spatial, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, there's two-dimensional space, which is the design of a page or the design of a screen. That's a kind of space. There's also three-dimensional spaces in which these things happen. So if we're doing a lecture and it's in a lecture theatre, if we're doing a musical performance, it's in a, a theatre of some sort. If we're having a conversation, 
it's framed by the cafe where we're where we're sitting and you know there's it's noisy and there's only two or three people who can speak so spatially things are configured as meanings as well and then we have tactile meanings objects which are extensions of ourselves which include media of all kinds so we're 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 making we're making our meanings using various objects physical media but also objects tools that we use have meanings in them which interact with our bodies and which have things written on them and which we can speak about um, then gestural meanings, um, we have a very broad definition of gestural. One is this kind of stuff that I'm doing with my hands, which is actually pretty systematic. I can't tell you what it is just now, but if you, uh, there's, there's books which actually parse gestures. And if you go to another culture, you might see strange gestures which you laugh at because these things are culturally specific in the same way that languages differ. Um, then the, the, what we have now is um, these things are closely connected with sound, but sound and, uh, and speaking are about as closely connected um, as written images with visuals. So in fact, um, speaking involves prosody, it involves uh, pauses, it involves silences, it involves... So in other words, in... in um, and by the way, we have whole genres which are oral and which involve um, um, uh, sound, which is like singing, songs, music. So in other words, what we have in the, in, the, in the real world is these remarkable interconnections and overlays between these different modes of meaning. Now, when we swap between one and the other, we call this a process of synesthesia. We can mean something in image, we can mean it in writing, we can speak about it, um, uh, and we can live it in embodied experience with objects and spaces. So in other words, what we have is a series of what we call transpositions, if you like, between one form of meaning and another. Uh, and that process of transposition, we say, is like synesthesia. We want to use the word synesthesia to describe this as a kind of a psychological process.